And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us all the way from Hansor Publishing, now, now fully funded, the is is um current campaign the Gaia Complex, the one and only the Shep man himself, Chris Shepperson. How you doing today, man? I'm really good, thank you. Yourself? I am do I am doing good. Um, Excellent. I'm cur I'm currently la I'm currently laughing at at um all the people down in Texas who would give who would give who would give me guff for years about me surviving Minnesota winters when they had to get, they had to get a taste of that medicine for for a while and everybody panicked. <laughs> yeah, we um our our winter was quite short lived. It was very cold, but very cold by my standards and very cold by your standards are two very, very different things. Yeah. Um but we've uh we've got sunshine today and enough to walk around without a jacket on, so um yeah that's winter done with. <laughs> yeah. I would I would say that winter's gonna that winter's gonna be done with me soon, but there's a bit of a habit of winter showing up for like a week in the middle of April. <laughs> like just all of a sudden it starts snowing, for and you'll get maybe a couple inches and then it'll be gone. Yeah, it just makes our weather cycle sound bland when you talk about weather. <laughs> um, well, to be well, to be fair. <sighs> I could I could make that argument with a lot of um with a lot of weather patterns in in Europe or in in Europe and in some in some parts of the UK where it's just no, where it's nothing but grey all the damn time. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't ever visit Scotland. Scotland's high up on my list for for that exact reason. <laughs> you just want if you want to see a bit of grey, it's a good place to go. Yeah. Um. Although I'm. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. These. I'm pretty sure. Everybody in Scotland would argue if somebody wants to really see grey, they'd go to Wales. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get involved in that uh, that, that war. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, if I look, I've had to deal. I've had to deal with having pissing matches with everybody in everybody in Wisconsin for 20 years. So, par for the course. <laughs> um. Now, we can't. Now, um, we kind of the last time I had you on, we kind of went into the, we kind of went into the origins, went a bit into um, cyberpunk, and um, one question that I want to ask to kind of set the stage is, with all the various forms that cyberpunk has taken over 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 the last for, over the last forty or so years, um. What would you what would you say is the thing that draws people draws people into this particular genre? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think there is. I don't think you can answer that with one thing. Um, I think uh, the technological marvel of the genre is really appealing to a lot of people. I think we um, are naturally drawn to the unknown. Hmm. And uh, sci-fi, as we know, is a massive genre in all of its, you know, kind of um, loose description. Um, the fact that cyberpunk takes m many of sci-fi's unknowns to a real extreme, um, but also generally slots them into a kind of environment that's almost relatable. You know, the places still kind of resemble the cities that we live in or certainly you know the larger uh, urban areas of the countries that we inhabit and i think that that fact that the genre is so relatable that people can almost imagine um that you know the city they live in could actually could be like that in a few years time makes it all the more scary mm -hmm. it kind of just makes it's like a, a hammer strike almost it makes you really realize that um the, the 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 concepts and the tropes that this genre covers an awful lot of are really just exaggerated versions of kind of the reality that we've got and i think a lot of people are really turned on by that fact 
um, the fact that they can peel. You know, it's, it's much easier to relate to, I don't know, the, the, a dark dystopia and a overzealous government and um, you know, industrial looking cybernetics than it is to relate to traveling the galaxy in a starship and exploring brave new worlds. Mm. Um, it's just much easier to kind of feel in touch with the genre. And I think that's probably the biggest pull for people. Yeah. Now, obviously you, obviously you've, da you've dabbled in your fair, sh in your fair share of cyberpunk games by, uh, by other people. And, sure. Yeah. Um, of course, of course, the big el the big two elephants in the room when it comes when it comes to this are go are going to be, um, sh are going to be Shadowrun and Cyberpunk twenty twenty because, well, third edition exists, but people but um it's a scub topic to bring up and um, Cyberpunk Red is too new is too new to be anyone's major influence just yet. Mm hmm. Yeah, so, absolutely. For the record, I don't, I don't hate, I don't hate, um, I don't hate um, Cyberpunk Third Edition. It's, ju it's just really bad, really bad timing, and maybe not the best um, message. Yeah, it was <laughs> a, it was a mixed game. I've, I've got, I've got everything they released mm -hmm. for it. Um, you know, it forms part of my collection, um, and I've got a lot of respect for what they yeah. tried with that edition. But, but it was a. It was a significant departure from 2020, and the, um, I think it, there were some I think interesting it, topics covered. I think it has more to do with the fact that it it um, kind of veered a little bit too much into the fantastical. Yeah. Um, gr granted, there was a problem with Cyberpunk being stuck in being stuck in the in the 80s that never was, but. That, but that's a whole other rabbit hole. But what I wanted to get at is, when looking at when looking at the when looking at those games, um, what were the kind of things with the Gaia complex that you specifically wanted to not do? I.e. the sure. i.e. the kind of because the reason I ask is, art is often a response to other art. Mm. And. I'm curious about what some of the things in Cyberpunk or Shadowrun that you were, well, responding to in this case. Sure, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a role player, and I've been a role player since I was in my teenage years, um, and I'm rapidly approaching 40 now. So I've been, you know, around the genre for a long time, and I, I, I grew up on Cyberpunk 2020. It was one of the first uh, RPGs I. Um, played and got involved in. I started with Werewolf and um, a Vampire, and then Cyberpunk and Slay Industries, and then eventually stumbled on Shadowrun uh, slightly later. Um, it wasn't that easy to access a lot of RPG stuff um, at first. I'm, I'm from Nottingham in the UK, and it's kind of like seen as the kind of home of wargaming in the UK. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the hometown of Games Workshop. And um, and it was like accessing miniatures, gaming, Warhammer, stuff like that was like every, every it was easy. Yeah, everybody could do it. The role playing was a was like slightly harder to find at the time and kind of discover. Um, so I was a little bit slow falling onto uh, a lot of the, the big boys. The cyberpunk um, really gripped me, I, probably for the reasons that I talked about earlier as a teenager. Like I, I liked sci-fi movies. I liked uh, the idea of being able to quite easily imagine that stuff happening outside the front door, and um, and I, I liked the adult, the implied adult kind of adult violent version of reality that was going off there. Um, as much as those original cyberpunk books left quite a lot to your imagination, um, I had a good imagination. I mean, most role players do, so that was great, and. Um, I was always less of a fan of Shadowrun. Um, there was aspects of the setting I found really cool, but there was also... I, I was never really into the fantasy, sci-fi merging of things. Um, and, and actually, when we played Shadowrun, we we kind of... Um, we got rid of the different sort of species. 
we just kind of played it as an alternative version of cyberpunk really i suppose it just wasn't something that aspect didn't really didn't really ring that heavily with me mm-hmm. um so i when i when I, I mean fast forward many many years playing my own stuff i'm still inspired by you know the pond smith's writing on on cyberpunk uh, it's uh, it's a very different way to how i write you know it's the de- it's designed to sound uh sound very 80s and have that kind of little bit of movie cheese to it mm-hmm. like it's designed to fill that that position um so I, i'm i was inspired to take aspects of those games that i grew up on and excited me as a teenager and write something that excited me just as much now um my my writing style on the guy complex is far more adult um and straight than those early cyberpunk releases and 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 cyberpunk red as well um some of the later Shadowrun stuff ventured a bit more into the mature language and slightly more graphic content but um i've also uh, you know i'm one of the more recent writers on slay industries as it moved into second edition and um it was a big honor writing on one of the games that i played as a teenager Mm -hmm. and um that game is very dark um the setting is very dark and very adult in its context and so i guess i i started to merge those kind of like uh aspects that inspired me about the technology and about the the kind of industrial feel to um the sci-fi and mix that with with the writing style i've adopted over the years which is something which is a bit more straight to the point um i describe violence as violence and i also like to talk a lot through people's voices rather than just writing about a setting i like to write in quote i write to write as the people in those settings and that allows me to um explore a whole different avenue and explore those things that that inspired me in a different way um so yeah i hope that kind of goes a bit of a way towards uh answering your question without rambling too much yeah now that does br- that does bring me to to the to-, to the topic of um, violence and it's fun now first off congr- congrats on being able to um being able to work on slay industries but thank you the the vibe that i always got with sl- with with something like slay industries is um not not too far removed not too far removed, although not as blatant as the vibe I get from um, cert- from certain series in 2000 AD, in the sense of both having a strong element of, for lack of a better term, black humor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not that's not to say Slay Industries is a is a par- is a parody or a or a joke, although neither neither is 2000 AD. It's a case of ta- of taking. Taking certain concepts and pushing them to their logical extremes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And something, th- something that I'm, cu- something that I'm curious about when it comes to, th- when it comes to that level of, um, vi- that level of violence is a lot of a lot of times when I've seen games that tr- that try and go for a a high leth- a high lethality approach. They end up ha- they end up either having um, low he- low health pools, some sort of increasingly punishing wound system, or um, a ex- or an extensive amount of cr- amount of critical results. I roll master, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, what were some of the approaches that you wanted to take when it came to refer- when it came to reinforcing that high lethality approach and hi- and highly violent um, nature of the Gaia complex. Sure. Well, we actually spent quite a lot of time on this during playtesting. Um, I'm very lucky to have had some very dedicated playtesters in the early days that were uh, helping to put all the different systems and mechanics through their paces. And um, it was really important for me that the game was, uh, that it presented the violence and combat in a way that is... Um, it, it clearly is lethal. I, I was going to use the term realistic, but I'm not quite sure 
I don't really like using that term How about where role believable? games are concerned. Yeah, believable works. I mean, at the end of the day, a role play game and board game rule set is a abstract set of mechanics or rules that are tied together with a with a theme. And if that's done well, they feel like they should be there. And if it's not done well, they might play the part, but they kind of feel a bit weird. And um, so there is the capacity to be shot in the head and die okay you can take a bullet and it can kill you um so that doesn't always happen you know there are more traditional um mechanisms in place that play a part such as wearing armor being in cover being a moving target but inevitably if you do get hit you are going to get hurt Mm-hmm. So um, I I wanted to um, make sure that could be explored in two ways. So as a core, there is a single pool of hit points, and weapons do a, a variable amount of damage with each weapon kind of having its sort of minimum level and maximum level. And um, cover and armor and things like that play their part in uh, making you harder, making it harder for you to, to get wounded. Uh, but inevitably, a couple of well-placed strikes could incapacitate you, um, and it and it works very well. It's quite simple and streamlined. There's nothing highly technical behind the system I use there. What I what I have also introduced is um, a number of optional rules, which are clearly labelled in the core book as being optional for those play groups that like to have a little bit more. Uh, believability, realism, grit, or complexity around their combat. And that allows you to open up things like uh, specific hit locations, being able to disarm limbs, being able to uh, feel the effects of bleeding, um, and uh, a various other number of aspects that make the combat system... In no way does it ever venture into what I would call crunchy, it's still relatively streamlined compared to many systems, but there are options for GMs and players if they really want to uh, add more in to make the the violence have more an impact. You know, mm-hmm. um, you're having to think about things like, you know, how long have I got before I'm going to bleed out? Like I can function still, but maybe I should stop and tend to my wounds. You like, I make gives the players uh, more decisions in those combat situations. We also introduced a a morale system for combat, which is kind of like a standalone little pool of hit points that is degraded every time you take physical damage and every time you come under heavy fire. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a prolonged firefight, you don't necessarily have to take damage to feel the effects of the combat. Lots of close landing bullets can eventually degrade your morale to the point that you are more likely to flee or freeze or um perform at a less than ideal level because you are uh, afraid or shell shocked or whatever it might be so there's all these little extra kind of bolt on modules if you like that mm-hmm. you can sprinkle into the game and you can include one or you could use all of them if you really wanted to that allow you to really um enhance the feeling of like you know the seriousness of of the violent aspects of the setting yeah now even even now given given that some something else that I've um, that I've seen with a lot of games that do, that are going to be highly vi- highly violent is is some is some sort of um, escape mechanic. Um, what I what I mean by that is some, is some way to to allow player characters to cheat to cheat what would have been what would have been a lethal blow. Um, I think one of the one of the more popular examples is fate burning in the um, 40k RPGs that Fantasy Flight had put out. Yeah. Which um, you can which I've seen some ar- I've seen some argue um, makes it makes it it makes it too easy. Except um, I'd ar- I'd argue it's I'd argue that's not the case since when you burn that f- when you burn that fate point, you're one you're not getting get it you're not going to get it back, and two fate points are not easy to come by so it is li- it is literally that red emergency that emergency escape button um yep and when it comes to 
when it comes to some, when it comes to something like um like grit like um grit do you see do you see that as as a potential use for for it or do you, or did you intentionally not want want to have some sort of emergency escape um setup sure yeah so the the grit mechanic which if, which is uh, effectively a uh, small pool of points that you uh, can spend to enhance uh, a number of aspects within the game. So uh, what you've just described can, uh, in certain ways, be achieved with grit. Mm -hmm. But it can only be achieved with grit through the use of certain cybernetic enhancements. So by that, what I mean is if you are a... Um, if you are just a you know, regular human being that... Um, has very little in the way of cybernetics or hasn't decided to put something in place to allow them to preserve their life then there is no there is no escape mechanic if you get shot you know a few times and you bleed out then your character has died however there are a number of cybernetic systems um from bioware organ enhancements to um different levels of subdermal armor and a number of these systems, particularly the higher end ones, have additional rules built into them as well as maybe providing you a boost to certain stats or certain skill, skill rolls and the like, where you can um, activate a new ability with which you can use grit. Mm -hmm. So um, many cybernetics have a, as well as doing this, you can spend a point of grit or two points of grit in order to achieve this situation. And there are a couple of um, items in there which will do exactly that. It will allow you to, the first time you hit zero hit points, mm -hmm. you can recover one hit point. Okay, so you can you can come back from death to being on the brink of death as a last ditch attempt for uh, somebody to patch you up. It's a life preserver. Yeah. And there's a there's a couple of uh, pieces of gear in there that which will enable something similar they all work slightly different but there are a couple of escape mechanics be them expensive um potentially dangerous installations for a for a human being mm -hmm. but um for people that decide to um put value onto you know that kind of thing rather than going down the classic i've got some cash i'm going to buy a bigger gun or i'm going to buy more cybernetic weaponry um Yes, absolutely. There are escape mechanics in there if you want to to play it that way. Yeah. Now, when it when it comes to um, so when it comes to cybernetics, I think I think we dis we've discussed this in the past. There's a, there's a bit of a trend of have of having of having some sort of cap system with um, with the use of cybernetics, whether it be um, whether it be human whether it be um, not humanity, but em but empathy, in yeah. the in the case of cyberpunk, I know I'm prob I know I'm probably messing up the specific name, but but that's bes that's beside the point. Or um, essence, huh. in um, Shadowrun. Yeah. And going going to putting too putting too much gear on you in this, in terms of cybernetics will turn well um, basically turn you into an NPC. Um, yeah. But if I recall correctly, you specifically wanted to avoid that that kind of setup. Um, I don't recall how we how far we discussed this last time, but we um we uh we do have a cap system. Uh, we originally tried during playtesting, and, and this would have been before um long before we last spoke. So mm -hmm. um we. We we tried loads of different stuff uh, when we were developing the rule system to um, find a way that, that worked. And quite simply, every playtester that we put this in front of just really loved the familiarity of having a system that allowed them to monitor what kind of level of tolerance they had to this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them seemed that bothered about what the outcome was of dipping below that tolerance, they just wanted to know that there was a threshold, that it was not impossible to just keep going. And um, as we developed the game, it became apparent that you know we needed, we did need some measure of things. So that 
measure of things in the guy complex is called disconnect which is a psychological condition associated with um becoming less human and more machine mm-hmm. um and each character has a different threshold for disconnect um that's set during character creation based on the way that you decide to pull your statistics mm-hmm. and um each piece of cybernetic will um reduce your disconnect by some items are a fixed value and others are random so there's a fairly familiar process for people that have played um games in the past if you replace cybernetics with more cybernetics so for example you bought a a hack job cyber arm and you later upgraded it to a high-end cyber arm you still lose the disconnect again every time something is wired into or unwired from your central system you you take the hit on disconnect and as that disconnect passes through a number of value levels you start to feel uh, a number of penalties implied to the character. So when it drops below 50% of its starting value, you start to feel um, that you get a dip in morale that we spoke about earlier on. And there are increasing um, psychological impacts on characters all the way down to passing the, the final threshold, which effectively uh, it turns you into a gibbering wreck. Um, I have a you know, people is capable to kind of go down as far as having a kind of psychotic break from reality. And um, so it's detailed in the book um, in a way that explains the system quite smoothly. And uh, we've got the two character types you can play, both human or feral. Uh, The ferals have a much uh, lower tolerance to um, disconnect. And so you'll find much fewer far fewer ferals with cybernetic enhancement throughout the game um so yeah that process exists it's not um, entirely original um we've got our own flavor on the impact of those things on the characters it doesn't work in the same way as it does in 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 other games but it's um it's certainly there and it's certainly familiar and it was also basically um really well liked and all and requested by the playtest groups for to, mm-hmm. to keep something like that in there yeah and now that that um that in particular brings me into character creation because obviously in the quick start um character creation wasn't something that was di- once it wasn't something that was dipped into yeah it was j- you just had a uh, you just had a set of d de- of pretty good um pregens but what I'm curious about is the is um the level of freeform that's go- that's going to happen since a big thing that I've um, been in discussion about with a lot of with a lot of people over the last couple of years has been ma- has been um how to handle choice paralysis. Now, obviously, yep. you can't get rid of it completely, but you can mitigate the issue so you d- so you don't overwhelm people with options. Especially yeah. something like Cyberpunk, where options is kind of g- going to be the name of the game. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, are you going? F- are you going full, f- full freeform, uh, a la car- a la karma spending, like you would see in say, um, sh- in say Shadowrun pre priority system, or are you go? Or are you going with something a little more structured, like the um, types set up in Cyberpunk or the priority system that was introduced in? Um, Shatter on fifth edition. Yeah, it's uh the guy complex is a much more structured system. Um, the, the 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 rule system for the guy complex is, on its whole, a pretty streamlined uh, system. So it's not overly crunchy. It's quite easy to understand the core mechanics. Um, there's not a huge amount of complexity, even in a lot of the optional rules that we've put in there. For people that want a touch more complexity, it's much more designed to prop up a narrative. Uh, gameplay style and um, and we wanted character creation to fall in line with that we didn't want it to be too cumbersome for people to get through and mm-hmm. um, we wanted to be able to get a group of new players together who don't know the system sit down around a table all build characters and still actually get some gameplay done in session one of a new group okay so that was the the idea really we're not going to spend our three hours building characters we're just gonna you know 
we're going to give it 30 minutes. We're going to come out with some cool characters and get on with it. So the basic system uses eight steps and you follow the eight steps in order. Um, the eighth step is really uh, how just how creative you want to be. It's kind of fluff and law, if you like. So there's seven steps of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is to decide whether you're going to play a human or a feral. Um, they, if, if for the, in the simplest way, if you play a human, you just follow the net, the, the following steps and don't think about it. If you're a feral, there are a couple of modifications that you will make and or limitations that are in place on certain things you might select over the coming steps. It's very simple. In, in summary, ferals are less academically smart and generally less physically uh, developed compared to humans, but they have much sharper uh, sensors, perceptions, social capabilities, and have access to a slightly different pool of skills. They're, they're the main differences. Mm -hmm. um, so once you pick whether you can play a human or a feral, you pick a role, uh, and there are 10 roles in the book. Mm -hmm. They're all relatively different, and each of them has a two-page spread that describes give you some example art we talk about what they are um a couple of quotes from people of that role and each um role gives you a number of bonuses and benefits first of all it gives you a starting package of skills you get four skills that kind of define that character role they give you a small bonus to a couple of your stats they give you um some cash a bonus a bit of cash to spend in a certain area so when you're picking your starting equipment for example, if you're a, an operator, you get a bit more money to spend as long as you spend it on a firearm mm -hmm. or a weapon. If you're a hacker, you have to spend that money on programs or hacking tech. And then you get a, uh, a trait, which is like a small um, ability that kind of gives that role an edge in doing the thing it does best. Okay, so fairly simple, straightforward, easy to follow. Pick a role, note down the things it gives you. Uh, and then you move on to setting your stats. You get a pool of points to, to divvy up between your statistics. Then you select a bunch of skills. Uh, you start with four. You get to pick 12 more skills from, mm -hmm. the, from the selection in the book. Um, so you start with 16 skills in total. Mm -hmm. And then you highlight two of those skills to be your specialization. So the areas that you are highly trained in, the areas that you're really good at. Okay, two of them. Mm -hmm. um, after that, you uh, using the stats that you've allocated, it tells you how to work out your disconnect. Same with hit points. Then buy some equipment, and then tell us who your character is. You know, go through how do they identify? What's their name? What do they look like? Have they got any motivations or secrets? So there's just a bit there to kind of prompt people to give the GM something to work with and give them themselves something to connect with their character. Mm -hmm. um, the process is not huge. There are not ridiculous numbers of options in any of those sections. I guess the biggest option is, you know, what do you want to spend your money on? You know, what cybernetics or equipment do you want? It's a cyberpunk game, so a decent-sized hardware catalog is essential. Um, but aside that, the process is quite is quite smooth. There's more than enough flexibility to make some really quite interesting characters. There's also quite a lot of... Um, uh, kind of new player simple limits that stop classic power gamer builds um, and um, yeah I think it's pretty well balanced and rolling up a character in 20 or 30 minutes is not that complicated to do it's, it's really quite smooth yeah now when it comes to when it comes to it when it comes to advancement I'm guessing that you I'm guessing that the approach you're going with is the experience as currency approach it is yes, and and in and in that is it is it mostly would it, would it mostly just be perch would the purchasing power mostly real, mostly um, be built around um, attributes sk skills at skills and the like or would there be the option to purchase um, talents? No, we uh, experience has been kept um, quite again it, to to fit in with the style of the system is not particularly convoluted uh, experience can be used in three ways um it can be used to purchase new skills it can be used to increase statistics and it can be used to gain additional specializations in skills so you start with two specializations uh give you a significant bonus and benefit so they are 
if you like the the big thing that players would want to strive towards getting specializations so um there's guidance in the in the gm's chapter on how the gm could um use um uh, allow players to use experience to for example um regenerate some used grit during a game um, and spend them in in different ways outside of the traditional between game downtime periods uh, but all those things are at the gm's discretion Mm-hmm. Um, but on its core, stats, skills, specializations, um, experiences are quite a, a nice and easy uh, system for anybody to understand. Yeah. Now, now um, take now, given th- given that, um, I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that in the GM section, there's gonna be a bit, there's gonna be some bullet points on what on what would be. Um, what what the what would be a good gui- what would be a good guideline in terms of how much experience one should get one should give out at the end of a session? Absolutely, yes. All right. I yeah. Can... So yeah, we um you basically there's a you get a point for taking part in the game, mm-hmm. and then there's a couple of other things that would earn a player a point, um and the, um based on any kind of not really a criteria, but if things like if they role played their character in a really thematic way, you know, like they really drove the session forward in the way that they actually role play, um, the GM can award a point for that. And then also there's a kind of like a, it's up to the GM. They want to give an extra point to somebody than they can. And if you get, uh, you can get a point for a great achievement, uncovering secrets, saving the lives of others, just doing things that are cinematic almost you know like really embodying the setting and the game and the way it plays um and generally speaking people will learn between one and three points in a in a game session yeah now given that you mentioned that one of the one of the potentially crunchy thing crunchy things with character creation is picking out your starting kit Mm -hmm. i'm curious i'm curious if you if you've um if you've put in an aside for um for sample packages, in ter- in terms of what in terms of what might be good what might be good um, starting picks for for a give for a given role. Sure. So um, the the short answer to that is no, uh, but the the reasoning behind that. So that's something that um, I in the original draft of the game, yes. Uh, so they were there, and that kind of largely came from. Uh, working on Slay Industries, um, the whole training packages mm-hmm. and operative starting kit concept is something that um, has been kind of a, a main of something I've just had in my head for a long time. It's the way I'm used to working around a role system. And I had that originally, one of the things that came with a role in this game was a, some like a kind of like a bundle of starting equipment. So um, the drone playtesting the um a couple of playtesters said like they really liked it but they felt like it pigeonholed certain roles a little bit too much um in the same way that often when you pick up a new core box for a game and you see the example piece of artwork for the combat character looks a certain way Mm -hmm. people's minds go off and they build that character and you end up with loads of people playing that character because that character looks cool rather than having a bit more diversity to go away and kind of make their own person within the confines of the role. So, um, which is, this was when we switched over to having, for example, the hacker gets 500, uh, you know, like currencies worth of, uh, programs before they get to the purchasing section. So you get this kind of like little bundle of cash to spend on a specific category in the hardware catalog, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, that was universally liked to be a lot more, uh, far more flexible and diverse than giving people a kind of set template of stuff. Um, you're actually the first person to say maybe some example packages of, for example, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things you might want to spend your money on if you were an operator or a data dealer or something like that. Uh, it's not a terrible idea, and I, actually I have got a little bit of space I can fill. That's not a terrible thing, and I something I might very well give some thought to. Um, 
but yeah it, there currently isn't that kind of guidance in the book we took out those kind of pre-made bundles for the in the interest of flexibility yeah um but uh one size doesn't fit all you know and um i'm always up for refining and making things uh, more accessible to players yeah i've um I will ad- I will admit that when that what I'm using as a frame of reference for that for that kind of thing is st- is um is stuff stuff like the st- the storyteller's companion when I when I used to play Exalted or the um, runner's toolkit in Shadowrun yeah where they where they have these um it's not it's not a full on char- it's not a full on example character or example build but more of more of al- more of allocations based on a specific theme. So if so- if somebody if somebody wants to be the quote unquote heavy weapons guy, for instance, then it, then it would be a list of suggestions on what um what might be good what might be a good um setup to to uh, per- to purchase. Um. And it's in- it's not too far removed from some of the um. From some of the op- from some of the optimization guys I've seen in o- I've seen in other games, where the- sure. where they um where they give a bit giving a bit of advice on what um, p- what particular attributes to focus on. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, no, I'm com- absolutely not against that um, the idea at all, and um, I think that's a good piece of feedback. Yeah. the The main reason I'm I'm always in favor of this kind of thing is to is to reduce the jump between people who are new to a new to a system and people who are more um, seasoned in how ha- in in how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that makes perfect sense. But be but beyond the, beyond that, when it comes to when it, when it comes to the whole um. The whole thing, the whole thing with the with the roles you mentioned. Um, you mentioned ten of them, and given how you mentioned that the ha- that the hacker gets a um, set am- gets a set amount of cash to spend on programs, um, mm-hmm. are they the only role that would have that would have some s- sort of setup like that, or would some of the other roles have a similar thing that's focused on another avenue of the system? Uh, yeah, so everybody everybody gets their uh, sorry every role gets their um, kind of what they're going to have to start with. So they have their the, the hacker gets. Uh, so if you're playing a core hacker, mm-hmm. you when as part of your um, setup, you can choose from the, the the programs list. You can pick any two programs with a total cost of no more than five hundred neck. Neck N E C is the currency of the game. New Europe currency is what it stands for. Okay, so uh, they've got five hundred we'll we'll call it credits because it's easier for explanation. So you've got five hundred yeah. credits to um to spend on up to two programs. And you effectively get those at the start of character creation before you're actually n- needing to think about how to spend the limited money that you've actually got to shell out of your pocket. Mm-hmm. So um the if you pick something completely different, like uh, I don't know, let's say the mill tech, for example, these guys are weapons techs or drone pilots, so the technical minded guys, they get um, uh, they get the same values worth to spend five hundred uh, credits worth, but they're buying their cat stuff out of the tools and gear equipment list, which is a separate part of the, the of the the gear and tech chapter. Mm-hmm. So it's a particular list of equipment that can be had now that that occurs for most of the different roles there's different areas that they can spend in for that for those kind of free gifts if you like uh, but there are a couple that kind of step 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 outside of that line um most notably would be the uh, tech trader and the data dealer so both of those guys get um more values worth of stuff they get double the value Mm-hmm. So they get a thousand credits worth of, but their equipment or what they're getting for their money isn't something that they're going to use. So, mm-hmm. whereas um, an operator would get five hundred credits worth to spend on a sidearm or in some close combat weapons or something like that, the data dealer is getting a thousand credits worth of valuable information on 
other people, NPCs, mm -hmm. corporations. It's up to them during the game to broker that information, to turn profit on it, to use it to their advantage. And it opens up doors for role playing. It opens up doors for more uh, for potential earnings for the group. Um, but it needs to be used within the setting of the game. Mm -hmm. Same with the tech trader. The tech trader has a thousand credits worth of, but they will be stolen goods, narcotics, uh, illegal technology, things that they aren't directly going to pull out of their pocket and use in the game. But with exploiting the right contacts, they are able to make profit mm -hmm. or use them as bribes or find, use it as a way in to uh other groups and other organizations so everybody gets items with a value but not every role kind of utilizes that concept in the same way if that makes sense uh, all right that i that is definitely something i can um work i can work around and get behind um and when you were do when you were doing um Getting getting back to the whole play, t getting back to the experiences with playtesting, were you finding that there were certain roles that were getting um, more use than others, or when you were doing playtesting, was it mostly around them? Um, was it mostly around the pregens? Uh, no. So the original round of playtesting was done with full access to the character creation section, so people were able to go wild with it. Mm -hmm. So, and initially there were three uh, roles that were more popular than the others. Okay. So, and they're three that I expected to be more popular than the others. So number one is the operator, which is the more classic combat Merc, Yeah. you know, ex, ex police officer, uh, thug for hire type character, which is almost like hard to draw people away from in cyberpunk or, games that may have a level of violence mm -hmm. the other one was um the the two the two types of hacker again um uh, a couple of the playtesters that i know um are also netrunner players so it was almost impossible to keep them away from the hacker roles um and again in that genre hacking is obviously something that's been done both quite terribly and with great excitement in various games over the years and so they were both very popular and then also the handler role which is a role which is exclusive to feral characters and that was really popular because a lot you can play a feral and you can be an operator or you can be a hack you can be anything as a feral but there is a role dedicated that only a feral can take as well and lots of people were really interested in exploring the how the ferals fit into this world and being a handler is effectively like playing a feral in its purest form mm -hmm. for want of a better term. So they were really, really popular and they got play tested to like the end of the earth, um, in the early, early days. Um, so we started, um, what we, the main thing we, we the main reason that we started kind of collecting information was to find out, if there were uh, any issues with the other roles that people didn't like as much, if there were things that kind of made them feel like they were inferior in any way to other roles. And it, generally speaking, the feedback was that um, it was just simply because these roles felt the most cyberpunk. Okay, so, um, and that was partially because, you know, the, the, the cyberpunk trope pulls those pulls the, the hacker and the operator in the most, and mm -hmm. that the feral was new and exciting and something new to try. So it fit those roles. The other way was possibly, um, and picked on by one one um, one playtester, the way that I had written up the, the lore and the introduction to those roles and characters. And it was explained to me that I'd basically made those three sound the most exciting in the way I'd written about them. So that was really good feedback for me to go away as a writer and look at the way I talk about, um, you know, mechs, Miltech, Cyberdocs, mm -hmm. and um, those kind of roles, and just to try and carve them a better place in um, in the world. And most of those roles were had an awful lot of work done on the the writing and the introduction to them. Um, 
they were really happy with with how that's come out. And mm-hmm. second wave of playtesting was far more balanced across all roles. Um, and um, it, interestingly, uh, some of the roles that you wouldn't expect, like the mech, which is effectively a, a mechanic, mm-hmm. um, you know, somebody that might in within the setting may either be a kind of local community, you know, kind of uh, garage kind of owner, or might be kind of down to sort of boosting cars. Uh, selling stolen vehicles, um, that kind of thing. That roles like that started to become really, really popular with people um, because they started to read more of the law that had been produced for the setting, w- learn more about how the world worked, and be able to see these people like in the context of the setting far more. And um, and I think that's really great. And I know a lot of games structure where you open the book, you get straight into character creation, you get, you get a rules overview, character creation, deeper mm-hmm. rules, and then you kind of get all your jam-packed lore and stuff at the back. We've, we've put our kind of primary lore chapter at the start of the book because we want people to be inspired before they get to character creation. So we get a nice, big, deep insight to the setting, the world, the people, who the, play, or the, who the PCs will be. You know why you do what you do and who you might be and then we move into character creation with people hopefully inspired by what they've read about the world and really be able to picture what their person might look like in there and through doing that mm-hmm. i think people are starting to pick you know far more varied um choice and, and give weight to all of the 10 available roles in the book which i can i can cert- i can certainly see that because I've had I've had my own share of experiences where so, where um where some where somebody um because of the fact that a ge- that a game had that a game had its lore backloaded um they end they end up up they end up applying um genre conventions from other games into this one I th- I think one I think one of the more enlightening instances of of this was a time when I was running um Ars Magica. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so and some and somebody somebody was because of the fact that this that this person either either skip either skip through the primer that I wrote or just or just um filled in the blanks in their head when they saw that we were doing a European a um Eastern European fantasy approach. Um, they they start they um ended up put they ended up putting in the sort of genre conventions you would see in D and D and asked, okay, who okay, who's who's going to be the he- who's going to be the healer? And I said, um, mm. no, it does it's not working like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to explain to him that the that whole that whole Trinity thing doesn't work doesn't um work in a game like this. And I've seen this and I can eat I've seen the same kind of th- you kind of hinted at it, but I can see the same kind of thing happening with people um, jump with people jump if if they were to jump into the Gaia complex without knowing the lore, they might um, imprint some of the stuff that they're familiar with, whether it be Shadowrun or Cyberpunk. Into sure, it. absolutely, and yeah. While the while there's certainly a Venn diagram that can be made with the with the two of the, with the two or three of them, um, that diagram is not, is not a complete overlap. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we um, the law is really important to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, uh, I consider myself a writer, and the guy complex has a story. Yeah. Um, originally, and we're going back many years. The original concept behind New Europe and Gaia, uh, the artificial intelligence that runs it, was sketched out as a novel that I was going to write. Mm-hmm. And I didn't take me too long to realize I was never going to write a novel. So, um, but I was a role player, and I have always loved injecting my own stuff into the settings that I've worked on or or ran as a GM. And um, and so I started fleshing out this world a lot more. I've always been hugely inspired by great world builders, you know. And I'm talking like Tolkien mm-hmm. and uh, you know people like that. You know, like huge, incredible world builders that just just you know it's more than just 
drawing a map and naming places on it. it you know what happens the industries in certain places the way people live in certain places the the intricate meta plots that underpin life in that setting and um being able to build an entire world like that has been a joy and something that i've been very passionate about and because of that, there's a lot of deep running stories. Um, there's a lot of important characters. There's a lot of fiction that sits around the Gaia complex that I've yeah. been able to tell in short stories. And I've been able to tell through explaining the law in in a way that, you know, is in, it's been really embellished upon. And I, um, it's really important to me that people, that people read that. And I know some people won't. They'll just want. They'll just look at the rule system in the quick start and say, "Yeah, cool. I like that rule system. I'll pick up the core book and I'll run my cyberpunk world out of that rule system. That's great." People will do that. That's mm-hmm. totally cool. Um, but I hope that people that have read the oh, the kind of slim down version of the overview that's in the quick start have said, "Oh man, this is this is really interesting. I want to read more." Mm-hmm. and uh i all i really want to do is give people more yeah um you know so yeah i i hope that the law serves to do that but there's it's really important to me and it was vital to me to front load it like like we have done mm-hmm. i want people to open that book and start reading the story behind the game the story that's you know from people's characters perspectives and then read about the world that they're inhabiting and then feel like I really want to play games in this world. I really want to explore it. Let's build some characters. That's yeah. the that's the idea. And when it can, a big a um a big issue that I've that I've seen with uh, and we may have we may have discussed this in the past, but a big issue that I've seen I've seen in the pe- in the past with games that are lore heavy is um is the concern of the concern of meta the concern of meta plot or in some cases what's known as continuity lockout. Yeah. Um and has has that been something that you were conscious of when you were writing the when you were writing the lore of making sure that it's not so de- making sure that it's not so detailed that um so, that somebody might be locked out of what they might want to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I um uh, I, th- that's one of the challenges that Slay Industry always faced. It had incredibly deep lore it had a meta plot that was always very well hidden um it was like hinted at sprinkled around over 20 years and whilst a lot of people became aware of what that meta plot was it was never explicitly spelled out and the content that was written was very varied and very wide and um some things would be referenced once and then never touched on again and or not spoken about for 12 years and it became a very complex thing for Nightfall games to manage and handle and to keep in line. So I, um, I am incredibly thorough and organized in the way that I approach work. I'm a project manager by trade, and I approach writing this game in the same way. Um, I catalog things. I run timelines. I keep records of every name of every person that's ever got that's accredited to a quote somewhere in the book and the dates what those people do what role they fill um consistency and continuity is vital to me so in order to do that properly i've the the law of this book is almost a tale of two halves or three halves i suppose there is there's the fiction there is a cast of characters and there are a number of episodes of short fiction that explain elements of the world and aspects of life as a merc through the voices and the experiences of some people who are at the top of their game Mm -hmm. okay these are like the cast of a tv series these are it's an episodic uh, story that occurs through the book and has a finale okay so uh, you can enjoy it as a single story if you wanted to Mm -hmm. um or you can see it as ways to inspire your games and inspire the information you're going to read in the following chapter that kind of thing so then i've got the the core law you know bang this is what the transport network looks like this is what how currency works this is what law enforcement is it's the factual and this is the opening chapter to the book okay so this is 
um, a, a good chunk of information that tell you this is who Gaia is, this is what New Europe looks like, this is what the technology level is, mm-hmm. this is what it's like to be a Merc and why people are Mercs, why the PCs are who they are. So it's quite it's written in a way that I think is easy for people to follow, but it's interesting, it's exciting, and it's detailed, and it and it serves to inspire the game, the world of the game. Okay. Outside of that, there's also the meta plot behind the Gaia complex. The name it's, of the game itself implies that there is something bigger at play. The introduction of Gaia as an AI in charge of the metropolis, in charge of millions of people, implies that there's something bigger at play. The fact that this setting is a vision of the future of Europe, it quotes places that we know in Europe. The art has European landmarks in it. Uh, yet there are vampires and ferals. Like, how can that be? There's something more at play. And the final chapter of the book, for people who want to delve deeper under the skin of the story that I have kind of written up as a backbone to this game, can delve into that meta plot, not only through reading some more fiction and also understanding how certain aspects of the setting... um, are have come to be but also it can open up a whole new world of thought for them but it's also done in a way where if you decided that the book ended a chapter early it wouldn't impact you in any way okay this game has a lot of secrets and lies around it but i give them all to you i don't plant seeds and i don't hide them from you i explain that meta plot that level of lore and detail and if you choose to use that in your games going forward then that's Mm -hmm. great if you don't, the game and the world that you've seen in the quick start and at the face value of my Kickstarter campaign and everything you've read about the guy complex online, that self-contained setting is, is, is lovely and it's great and it's well fleshed out and there's in more than enough there to inspire you for years of gaming. Mm-hmm. But I've been very, very careful to make sure there's a clear, li- uh, a clear divide where those, where those lines meet. You know, it's easy to be able to say, this is cool. I love all this world building law. I'm not really into a meta plot or I want to, involve, I want to pull everything together. Is it consistent? Does it all tie together? And the answer is yes, it does. I, I believe it does. Yep. And I, th- I'll def- I'll definitely be keeping a close eye on how, on how it develops and how, um, how people end up fi- finding new and interesting ways to get torn into pieces because, <laughs> <laughs> TPKs are going to be inevitable, <laughs> <laughs> but with that with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to, to come on to the t- come back to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh no! Thank you so much for asking me to come back again. You know, it's been many months since we talked about my quick start and um it's a real honor for you to keep your eye on the game and invite me back now that the the kickstarter campaign is heading towards its its final days and um you know i I really really appreciate the uh, the space and the opportunity Mm -hmm. and and of course and of course um anytime you see fit to return the door is always open amazing thank you so much and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>